Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for, uh, thanks for getting up bright and early and being here. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you today. Uh, President Atkinson and I were just speaking uh, in the back of the room here. I am thoroughly impressed by the South Carolina Firefighters Association. Uh, up north where I come from, by the way, uh, you're, uh, you can thank me for bringing this winter weather along. You're going to see a slide about that in a little while here. Uh, when I left home yesterday, it was 26 degrees. It was uh, 12 degrees last week, but we have no snow on the ground. So when I came down here, actually uh, Chief Minnick, and thanks to Chief Minnick for, for bringing me down here, uh, called me up last week. He says, just so you know, it's 42 degrees down here. And I looked at, uh, sitting in my office, and I looked at the bank clock across the parking lot, and it was 44 by me. So a little warmer up north, but I'm, I'm glad to be here and appreciate that. So we have a, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, you're going to see some of my contact information coming up here. I do want to thank you for bringing me in. Uh, this is sincerely, uh, certainly a, a, a treat to be here. I am honored and humbled to be in, in front of you today. So we have a lot of information to cover today. And by the way, uh, when I told my boss, my city administrator, that I was going to be taking yesterday off and flying down here, she said, uh, she was jealous. She says, oh, it's going to be nice and warm down there. And then I woke up to this on the Weather Channel this morning. So <laughs> I, I don't know what happened. I, I packed the carry-on. That's all I brought with me. I didn't bring anything else. So uh, again, thanks for having me down here. There's my contact information. If you want to put that down, you're going to see it at the end as well. I am a very accessible, reachable, transparent person. So if there's anything I can help you with, or anybody I can put you in contact with, please feel free to reach out to me. And uh, I will certainly do what I can. Like Chief Minnick and, and the other Chief Minnick and some other folks in the room, uh, I have colleagues literally across the country that are more than willing to share what they have. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you're, if you're looking uh, for some information. And if you're gonna, going to uh, make a trip up to the great state of Wisconsin and you're passing through the Milwaukee County area, southeastern Wisconsin, look me up as well. And, I'll try to meet up with you for a cocktail or lunch or breakfast or whatever the, whatever the day allows. So this is what our goal is, right? Our goal is make the fire service better. As President Atkinson mentioned, I'm a 38-year veteran. Actually, 39, just started my 39th year in the fire service. That is me in 1981. I, I hid the uh, porn star m uh, mustache I had up there. And I also had hair that you can't see because of the helmet, but that is me with one of the greatest mentors I ever had, uh, the training officer for the city of St. Francis. And he told me back then that our goal in the fire service is to make things better. We solve problems. And that's what we do. If you think about what you do with your men and women every day is we see problems, we fix problems. That's what we do. So our goal is to make the fire service better. That's what we're here for this morning. I'm here to learn as well. Okay. Now I will tell you, I always throw out this disclaimer. If at some point you know something more about what I'm talking about, I'm not the expert on this. Nobody's the expert on this. But if you know something or I say something that is, you know, maybe not clear, please feel free to raise your hand. Don't throw anything hard or sharp at me, but please bring it to my attention. I am here to learn as well, and I offer that up. This is my goal today. My goal is so that one of you leave here today with one new idea, notion, or thought that could save your life or the life of a brother, sister, firefighter. That's it, real simple. I've done, I don't know how many people we have in here today, dozens and dozens, but I've done this presentation in front of a, a nine person volunteer fire department with my projector plugged into the same outlet that their sump pump in the basement plugs into. And it doesn't matter to me, as long as one person leaves, okay? Now my guarantee here today is that when you leave, you will have a different opinion of these buildings. All right? You will never look at one of these buildings again after the same way that you did prior to this after you leave here today. You'll pull into that drive through at McDonald's to grab a coffee and you'll look up and say, boy, that guy from South Milwaukee said something about this. And I know that's true because the very first time I did this was for the Illinois State uh, Fire Chiefs Association. And I was invited back the next year to attend the conference. So here I was in a hospitality room drinking soda. In the hospitality room, and a fire chief comes up to me and says, hey, you're the, you're the guy from Wisconsin. Mm, yeah, that's me. I thought maybe it was going to be a Bears-Packers thing, and he's going to take me out back and rough me up. And he says, you know, I attended your program last year. I said, about two months after that, we had a fire in a McDonald's restaurant. And the whole time I'm driving to that response, I'm thinking about your presentation. 
And to me, that was bingo. The hair went up on the back of my neck. He listened to what I had to say. Maybe he caught one thing. And I asked him, I said, so did you learn anything in my presentation? He says, I learned to look at him differently. And that's what I'm here for today. Okay. So let's get on. When did this start? Where did it start? Really, it started with this event right here. February 14, 2000, Valentine's Day, Houston, Texas. A lot of people are familiar with this. Hopefully everybody in the room is familiar with this. This is a, a screenshot of the NIOSH report. And you haven't read the NIOSH report of the Houston Fatalities. It took the life of Kim Smith and Louis Mayo III. Do yourselves a favor, do your department a favor, do your community a favor, and read it. But what struck me is right after this, this uh, incident, the, the training series, video series American Heat came out. Anybody familiar with American Heat? We used to call it American Sleep because when we would throw the, the video in the, the recorder and sit ourselves in the Lazy Boys, we would probably doze off. But we wa we, I stayed awake long enough to watch part of a video that you're going to see here, and something that was said in that video caught my attention. So I'm going to try to play that video here. Together, to pay their there we go. Thank you. Because their duty is dangerous. We see that okay back there? Two years ago, that an entire city was wondering how it could happen. The fire soon after had ultimately led to the death of two Houston firefighters. It was two years ago that firefighter Russell Dunham lost his best friend. And even after two years, this symbol of two lives lost doesn't represent the ending that you might think. It was the untimely deaths of Kim Smith and Louis Mayo that shook Houston firefighters into what some would call a new beginning. I hope that I'm doing this a lot better than I used to be, because I thought, you know, I was a pretty good captain. Now, you've got to see where the fire is on these restaurants. Because most of them, I think, are going to have wood press construction. And to look at a building, not just on the four sides, but what's on top of the good. And we trust is good for really about two things. It saves them money and it kills firefighters. It was two years ago on Valentine's Day. Breaking in was easy. The teenagers had a key, courtesy of an inside accomplice. The robbery was quick, but it wasn't until they left that they realized the evidence they left behind might catch up to them later. So they went to a nearby 24-hour department store and bought a propane torch. It was 4.30 in the morning. I didn't think we had anything when we got to run at 4 o'clock in the morning at McDonald's. Didn't see like false alarm. The doors came up on the on the apparatus floor. I turned to my driver Jerry and I said, "Man, look at the frog outside. It's really thick." When things like that happen. Most firemen know that something bad can happen. The initial alarm included four engines and two ladder trucks. Ladder 76, commanded by Senior Captain Hoyt, was the second apparatus to arrive on the scene. I never saw the fire until we were almost right on top of it because it was so thick. I knew we had a fire because uh, the uh, engine had gotten there first and said they had fire coming from the roof. We had a fire about five to eight feet high and, and not much bigger than five feet diameter right on one of the vents. And I, uh, I know I assumed, I know my driver assumed that we had a, probably a restaurant and probably had a fire somewhere or something on the, the, you know, the grease flared up and got up the vent. It was a familiar fire in a familiar place. I guess two years ago we had one of my kids' birthday party there. And at the time I didn't even think, okay, I, didn't, I know this layout. It's just like every other McDonald's. You go on vacation or anywhere in your neighborhood. And it was the one where there's a little dining area in front, the counter, there's a long dining area on this particular one on the right hand side. And all the kitchen areas consolidated in one area. Typical restaurant incident is a small blue fire. Uh, you just, you know, you know, it'll present with a small fire coming through the roof, and they usually don't go anywhere because it's all non-flammable. A little bit of shafts break through the roof, and if they do, they boil out a little bit on the roof, that's it. No, we don't figure it's going to be a real simple deal, out and gone. Engine 76 had arrived first. The captain sized up the building and made a quick decision. <laughs> Kim 
William Smith and Louis Mayo took a hook line and forced entry into the restaurant on the west side by the drive through windows. They went straight for the kitchen. You have to assume someone's in there until they know differently at 4.30 in the morning in a restaurant. We always assume somebody's in there until we know better. While Captain Hoyt and Ladder 76 also staged on the west side... Keep that thought in mind as we move through the program here. He would assume command. I didn't see him from the west side, so I thought he must have pulled in on the east side, so I walked around the front of the building to the east side to see him. And when I did, there was, there was like a, it was the weirdest thing, like a fundamental change in the fire. It went from no fire that I ever saw inside to when I walked around the other side, there was a lot of fire coming out of the east side window. And it had apparently, I mean, it just happened in the time between my walk from the west to the east side. I'm, I've always assumed that that's when the uh, first collapse happened. I, I did not see any change, never heard anything. Uh, I went from a, a nothing fire to a wow fire, just from one side of the building to the other. I mean, I was really surprised. Neither Captain Hoyt nor Chief Petrosky knew of any collapse at the time. They just knew this was suddenly more than a grease <laughs> fire, and they both knew what to do next. <laughs> Pay attention to the amount of fire above their heads and watch these two firefighters. I went inside the east side door and just drove up inside to the dining room. We'll talk about that a little later. I was yelling, just to the back, everybody get out, everybody get out. I never heard anything, I never heard any voices. Chief Petrosky immediately called for a personnel accountability report. Senior Captain Hoyt. Now we're looking at a department that is rather large, well staffed, well equipped, well trained, and they lose two firefighters in a McDonald's restaurant. And when I'm watching this video, I listen to what Senior Captain Hoyt has to say, and he talks about a fundamental change in the fire from one side of the building to the other. These are not large buildings. This room we're sitting in right now is bigger than most of these buildings, probably bigger than all of these buildings. And what caught me is when he made this statement. I went from a nothing fire to a wow fire from one side of the building to the other. And I was really surprised. And that caught my mind or caught my attention and I thought, now here's a senior captain from Houston Fire and that, the, the explanation behind that volume of fire, that fundamental change, was never talked about. So I started doing some research and I found out that there really was not much out there, okay? Now there's a I'm going to segue into a, a statement here. Uh, you've probably all heard this in one way, shape, or form. Um, this quote is attributed to George Santayana, Spanish-born American philosopher, poet, and humanist. Those who do not remember the past <coughs> excuse me, are destined to repeat it. What does that mean to us in the fire service? What does that mean? It means if we don't learn from what has happened in the past, we're going to repeat it, right? Now, people say, well, if we don't learn from our mistakes, but you have to remember that we have to learn from the positive side of what we do too. When we have a success, 
we need to talk about it. When we have a success, we need to spread the word that, hey, this is, this is what worked for us, okay? And that's another reason why we're here today. So we're going to talk about this. We'll come full circle back to this a little bit later on at the end of the presentation. So it happened again. We fast forward to August 29th of 2007. The fine folks in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston, Massachusetts is what? It's a rather well-funded, well-staffed, well-organized, well-trained, well-equipped department. Another big department. I, would, I am envious on how they staff things. Okay? In this case, it wasn't a lightweight, constructed, freestanding restaurant like the McDonald's in Houston. It was part of a taxpayer-style, you know, I don't want to call it a strip mall, but a series of buildings like that. But in this case, same thing. A fundamental change in fire conditions happens. If you have an opportunity to read the story behind this fire, again, there's lessons to be learned. There are two Boston firefighters in that building right there when it's on fire. And all of a sudden, there is a fundamental change. The cause of the fire is significantly different than Houston. The cause of the fundamental change significantly different. But the end result is the same. A significant fire, a significant fire event that takes the life of two of the Boston Jakes, two of their finest. All right? Here's a cell phone capture of the fireball that is enveloping, literally incinerating the two firefighters inside that building. If you, if you look closely at that, you can see the tip of the ladder on the picture on the right and the, the sign for the Mandarin Cantonese Cuisine restaurant there. They are inside that building right there when that fireball erupts, 30 to 40 feet in the air. They are incinerated where they're at. When they get there, they're told that there's a fire in the, in the concealed space. And we're going to talk about that above the ceiling tiles like we have above our heads. We're going to talk about that. In several instances, the fire is racing unchecked through that concealed area, through the void space up there. In this case, they suspect the fire was burning for up to an hour before they called 911. The Boston Firehouse is literally three or four blocks down the street. They are there in minutes. They stretch a line to the inside. They think they have a fire up in, or they know they have a fire up in that concealed space. And instantaneously, they have a significant fire event that takes place. In this case, uh, in the case of Houston, both of those firefighters, uh, well, Lewis Mayo was killed in a, the collapse of the roof, okay? So the HVAC equipment on the roof collapses down. He's literally trapped underneath uh, one of the air handlers. Kim Smith is trapped runs out of air right near the back door. You're going to see a graphic about that in a little while. We'll talk about that. In this case, there was a collapse, a failure of the roof structure. The integrity of the roof, roof structure uh, was compromised, and there was a, a breach of that, but there was not a collapse. It didn't collapse on top of them. What it did is it fed the fire air. The fire was burning in that concealed space for up to an hour, they suspect, because the proprietors there, the people working in there, thought there was something going on. They, and finally, they saw a little wisps of smoke come out of the ceiling tiles, and that's when they called 911. But they had heard noises up there, and they suspect that the fire was burning for up to an hour. So if it can happen in Houston, if it can happen in Boston, it can happen in any one of our jurisdictions. And if you don't have any fast food restaurants in your jurisdiction, chances are very good right across the border through mutual aid, automatic aid, shared services, whatever you want to call it, you're going, going to be going to these fires. And one of the things we talk about here is the amount of resources that these fires take. A fire in a building no bigger than this room requires sometimes two, three alarms because you've got to get a lot of water on it. It goes right back to that GPMs over BTU equation that we talk about. So you've got to get a lot of water on it to put that fire out. Right? We'll talk more about that. So let's go back to Houston. It's 4.30 in the morning on Valentine's Day of 2000. The critics right away were saying, the Monday morning quarterbacks were saying, so why take a risk of an interior attack? It's a disposable building. It's a lightweight constructed McDonald's restaurant. Who's going to be in there at 4.30 in the morning? If the American Fire Service, if their job is to save lives, in this case, it costs them two lives to try to save property. Well, you heard what, you heard what he said in that video, right? He said, that building's not vacant or that building's not empty till we say it's empty. And that really is the mantra of the American Fire Service. That's what we do. That'll come into play here this morning as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's a McDonald's restaurant in my area. Is there a reason to go in there and search this building at 4.30 in the morning? If you show up and there's fire coming through the roof and there's nobody out there in the parking lot to meet you, is there a reason to go in that building? In the mantra of the American Fire Service, our job is to save lives. We're going to commit personnel as safely and on our terms of conditions to go in there and search that building. 
So this is where it, it is in your best interest to have that understanding with your building inspection department, with your fire inspection department, so that you know the, the makeup of your community and maybe your neighboring community. And pre-planning is the key because if you show up at this McDonald's at 4.30 in the morning and there's a significant fire in there, there's a fire in there that when you look at the risk management scheme of things, you can still make a safe interior approach to a, do a search and rescue. When you, enter, or when you show up under those conditions, you're going to commit personnel to look for people. If they're not there in the parking lot to greet you and say, hey, we're all right here. All right? So keep that in mind. That's why they made the commitment. Because that building's not empty until we say it's empty. Right? We have any dual hatters in here? Any law enforcement? Any police officers? That you can admit it. We're all friends, right? We're all friends. Ah, oh, see, we got one. All right. I'm married to a cop, so she doesn't mind if I, you know, talk certain ways about. Well, she doesn't know I do, so don't tell her. But <laughs> please, don't don't share that. Um, but when we show up, oftentimes, or while we're en route, the dispatcher might call us and say, "Hey, PD's on the scene, and the building's empty." Even then, sometimes they may not have done what we would do, right? To go to do a a systematic search of the entire building. So truly, on our terms and conditions, if there, we show up at this building, chances are very good, we're going to do, uh, go in and do a, a systematic search of that building. All right, that's why we're here. This building, or this building, this book doesn't exist, all right? Nobody has written the book on fast food restaurant fires yet. And unfortunately, I mean, we, we had a good start back in 2000, a gentleman by the name of James Kirsch uh, out of New Jersey, wrote an article in Fire Engineering Magazine. Uh, it happened to come out right after the Houston tragedy, but it had nothing to do, it was just coincidental that he wrote that article. I still carry this article with me in my bag of tricks back home. A, a good article, all right? But very little research, very little written documentation about these lightweight, constructed, freestanding buildings exist. We use these two, these two textbooks in our, our associate degree program back at the Tech College, okay, on strategies and tactics. Not a single mention in either one of them of, or, or not a significant amount in either one of them. Chapters on high-rise fires, and yeah, we go to high-rise fires occasionally, but not nearly as much as we go to fires in fast food restaurants. They have equal challenges, maybe, you know, more manpower personnel required, or personnel required for a, a high-rise fire, but in fact, there isn't a whole lot of written material, so that's why we're here today, to learn about this. And where do we start? Like I said, you have to talk to, about, or talk to your fire inspection, your building inspection department. Some fire departments don't do fire inspections. I don't know how it is down here, but up by us, the biggest city in the, in the state of Wisconsin, the city of Milwaukee, has nothing to do with fire inspections. Can you imagine that? They have a Department of Neighborhood Services. They have building inspectors that do fire inspection. So the city of Milwaukee, fire inspections are done by building inspectors, totally disconnected, which is unfortunate for that. In my situation, I have three fire inspectors in, on my staff. So we have a direct communication link. And they're actually firefighters. So when they go out and see something like this, they know that it's a priority to bring it back to us and share with the line personnel. All right? That's the idea. Pre-planning is the key. And just keep in mind that it doesn't matter what name is on the sign. Matter of fact, you're going to see a picture later on of a, a fire that took place in a, a repurposed building in North Charleston that used to, it looks like it used to be a Taco Bell and now it was a check cashing place or something. It doesn't matter what name is on the building. What matters is what's inside, above your head, and up on the roof. Those are the things that are going to sneak up and kill us, and we have to be aware of that. So that's why we're here. You can go into your internet search engine, go to that internet thing that Al Gore invented, and Google or Bing or whatever, fast food restaurant fires, and you will get thousands and thousands and thousands of hits. All right? They are more prevalent than you think. I have a, a, a good network of colleagues across, across the country that continuously send me links to fires that took place. As a matter of fact, you're going to see some slides that have never been seen in my presentation before because two nights ago, a good friend of mine sent me a, um, a link to some, a fire that took place in Wilmington, Delaware, in a Taco Bell. And there's always lessons to be learned. Okay, so this is, this program, the beauty of this program is it is a work in progress and there is always more information to include in it. All right. Now one of the things I've learned that in most cases we have a rapid fire spread from the occupied level, either the food preparation area or the customer service area up into the concealed space and then eventually it burns the roof off or gets in there and we're off to the races. Normally, normally, 
Now, we only have one law enforcement friend in here, right? Nobody else wanted to admit that in public? I, I always like to know that. Just keep the area clear around here. Anybody have any ammonia inhalants in their pocket? We got EMS on standby? Because I like to show this picture. It happens to be a Dunkin' Donuts on fire, all right? And I, sorry, I'm, I'm married to a cop. I, I, I get, all right? But this, the, the case in this, uh, or the situation in this case is a little bit different. So this fire, it actually did start in the, the food preparation area, but it got quickly up into the concealed space. And if you take a close look, it's taking hold of, that, of the, uh, the concealed space there because you can see the soot staining underneath the Dunkin' Donuts sign. All right, and you see the fire coming through the roof. For those of us that don't see a whole lot of fire every day, that orange stuff, according to the news media, is fire. And uh, this is a little different. There are fires that start on the roof and proceed downward. Right? They start in the HVAC equipment, an overheated motor, something like that, and then it burns through the roofing materials down into the concealed space. But normally, it finds a way up into that concealed space. And we're going to talk about the importance of the, the drop ceiling systems like we have above our heads here. All right? We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. A lot of information to cover. So here's a, here's a good uh, a look at some of the, the more recent fires, actually. That one down in the bottom there, uh, North Charleston, by the looks of it, it looks like an old Taco Bell that's been repurposed, and I think it was a check cashing place. Anybody familiar with that? Anybody familiar? Is that what it was, right, Taco Bell? Um, so just keep in mind that they, they do repurpose these buildings, and ironically, in my neighboring community to the north, there's a Taco Bell that is actually a check cash and go place. That's the name of it. So they've repurposed them. Um, the construction hasn't changed. The hazards from the construction has not changed. The cause of the fire very well has changed because they're not going to have deep fryers and things like that. But if there is a fire in there, chances are good that the structural integrity of the building that day is the same as it was when it was a Taco Bell. And we're going to see a, a short video of this other Taco Bell over here on the, the left-hand side that took place two years ago, a couple days before I did this presentation uh, down at FDIC. So hopefully we... There we go. They were cooking on reports of the smell of smoke and found only a small fire at first, but conditions caused the flames to spread quickly and soon the fire was so intense that firefighters had to battle it from the outside. We realized that the fire was actually in the mantry going around the roof. Uh, had some difficulty getting into that due to the clay tile that's around that mantry space. And then by that time we had some concern of uh, two large HVAC units on the roof uh, coming in possibly uh, due to a roof collapse. And uh, we were also dealing with some significant 15 to 20 mile an hour winds blowing uh, today that pushed the fire through that answer space that we weren't able to get into <coughs> very well. And fortunately, everyone made it out safely. It's unclear right now if the building will have to be torn down. So, <clears throat> another fire in a Taco Bell. And that deputy chief there pretty much summarized my two-hour presentation in about a minute and a half news clip, but that's okay. We'll talk more about that. Here, here's the, uh, the size of some of the buildings, some of the fast food restaurants in my area. And if you take a look at that, they're not that large. And the reason I point that out is because the amount of resources, the, these fires are easily going to two and three alarms to tie up resources, valuable resources, to put water on a building that probably, after the fire's out, is going to be bulldozed put into a dumpster, hauled away from the scene, and in about four or five, maybe six months, you're going to be there and they're going to be handing out balloons to little kids because it's the grand opening. That's the reality of it. But that doesn't mean we can't put fires out in these buildings. If you have a, you, you heard at the beginning there, it was a small fire when they arrived, and then pretty soon, lightweight construction, heavy HVAC, fires coming through the roof, wind-driven, all of those catchphrases that we're studying now, all right, the things that we're looking at. But they tie up an awful lot of resources when they do. So we're going to start real quick looking at some of the common causes of these fires. Because I firmly believe that as incident commanders, if we know where the fire or where possibly the fire started, we can focus our, our fire attack. We know what's taking place there. So we're going to rifle through uh, some quick common causes of these and some newer things that are starting to hit the, the popularity contest here when it comes to fire causes. Probably the most common one is the overheated cooking media. Now remember about 10 years ago, there was a big push to be more heart healthy. 
So they, they got away from an animal fat based cooking media to a vegetable based cooking media. And when they did that, we had to change a couple things. We had to change to a class K extinguisher. You know, before that, anybody who taught uh, in the tech college system, we had how many classes of fire? Four, right? A, B, C, D. And then all of a sudden they threw class K at us because we had a special class of fire just for combustible cooking media. And that really is because they changed from a animal-based cooking media to a vegetable-based. Changed the whole dynamics. Well, along with having to put together a new type of extinguishing system, a wet chemical extinguishing system instead of a dry chemical like we were used to, they also had to change the, the design of the appliances. And in order to make that stuff cost effective and useful in cooking and preparing food, the, the uh, appliances have to burn hotter, all right, which obviously causes a little problem. This is a fire that I had in a McDonald's restaurant very early in the morning. Now, uh, very good friend of mine owns 13 McDonald's restaurants in my area, so he's probably buying BMWs from this area and drives around in an SUV. Uh, he inherited it from his father, lucky man. But some of his restaurants, uh, he's given me carte blanche access to all of his restaurants. Pictures and tours and you name it, and you'll see a lot of those in here. Uh, this french fry machine, this isn't from a Burger King like the sign says, this is actually from a McDonald's. And what happened here is the manager shows up, this isn't a 24-hour a restaurant, manager shows up at about 5 o'clock in the morning, fire things up because they open up at 6 for the coffee crowd or whatever. And she um, fires up, she turns on the, the electricity, the breakers, the main control, for the, for the deep fryer and goes to her office. And she's sitting in the office doing the morning books or whatever, scheduling, and she hears a poof, literally a poof as she describes it, and she looks out there and that center vat is on fire. Well, it turns out that because of the, the volume of cooking they do, there's actually three vats in that appliance and they only use two of them. Well, the, the crew that went off shift the night before thought they were doing her a favor and they emptied that center vat, all with the exception of a couple inches of oil. So she turned on the, the machine thinking that there was enough oil to absorb the heat from the heating coils, and lo and behold, there wasn't, so she had an ignition of that center. Now, if you look at what she used to extinguish the fire, as a matter of fact, the hood system didn't go off at all because the fire was extinguished, or, extinguished by her with a portable a hand extinguisher, a class K extinguisher. Perfect scenario. She's the manager, she's trained to do that. She really saved a lot of damage to that building. Of course, there's smoke in the building. We employ, we share a, a health sanitarian with some of our neighboring communities, so we call him up, we get him in there, he gives the blessing to open up everything except that deep fryer, obviously. So that's a very common cause. And I call it unintentional because she had no reason. It wasn't, it wasn't an intentional thing. She flipped the switch and next thing you know, she's got that thing burning, all right? Um, the grease buildup in the duct, duct work, very common as well. I'm not sure about the codes here in South Carolina, but in Wisconsin, there's a code that says you have to maintain a clean duct system, but there's no duct inspectors. Matter of fact, there's nobody that even regulates the duct cleaning companies. So in Boston here, from that scenario, when they looked at the cause of the fire, the fire was burning in the duct work up there. And almost immediately, the city of Boston, state of Massachusetts, went after the owner of the building. And the owner of the building provided a receipt from a duct cleaning company and said, no, I had these things clean. So then they went after the duct cleaning company. And they found out that they didn't do the job they were supposed to do. They didn't clean the ducts they were supposed to clean. All right? And that attributed the fire started in the duct work, traveled unchecked in the duct work, caused the fire to be burning up in that concealed space for up to an hour, as I said earlier. All right? There are some pictures after the fire from the Boston Fire Department report. There's a catch pan there of grease. You can tell they didn't clean what they were supposed to clean. This is the piping for the hood system. There's a fusible link that's covered up right there. Now the fire started in the ductwork, okay, not on the cooktop. So that hood system really isn't going to do much good until you have drop down fire or something that gets that that hood system activated. This is a fire up in the ductwork itself. Improper storage, it's the back end of a, uh, this picture here on the left of these two pictures is the back end of a Burger King restaurant in my city. It's about three years old. We get called there for smoke coming out of a wall. So I just happen to be in the area. I show up, the engine company's there, and it happens to be one of these um, 
basically a fiberglass panel that's on the wall to, so they can clean it and protect it and there's smoke coming out from behind it. Well, it turns out to be the electrical system for, the, for a cooler, a built-in cooler there. So they have to pull off the fiberglass panel and they have to pull off the drywall and I tell my, the crews there, I says, hey, why don't you do them a favor and while you're pulling that stuff off, pull it in that garbage, or put, put it in that garbage can there, then we'll wheel that stuff out of here. It's a good customer service thing, we'll try to help them out and keep it clean. And one of the firefighters walks over there and there's a piece of cardboard sitting on top of that, you can kind of see it right here, on top of that garbage can and he says, hey chief, I don't think we want to be putting this stuff in there. Why is that? He goes, come take a look. So I walk over there and look and there's about eight inches worth of used cooking oil in the bottom of that garbage can right there. So I go contact the assistant manager who's working, she's there in the front of the building and I says, hey, what's the story with this? Well, they have a distribution system for their waste oil and their new oil. They're no longer handling it. There's pumps that push the stuff back and forth and the, the pumps are broken. So they're doing it manually and they're storing it in that container in the back. So again, just the accumulation, improper storage and that's carelessness, let's face it. Now, they obviously don't know that that's a hazard that, that could add fuel to the fire as the, the saying goes, but nonetheless, the storage uh, careless or improper storage is, is prominent here because of the size of the buildings. And you'll see that a little later as well. For those of you that have any interest in the fire inspection business, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see there's obviously a water heater in the back there. You'll see another, I believe I have another picture later on about that where they actually have striping painted on the floor that tell you not to keep anything there. But it doesn't matter if they don't understand. And that's where we, that, that leg of fire prevention of education comes into play that we have to educate them on why they need to behave themselves, basically, why they can't be careless like this. All right? uh, another McDonald's restaurant, this is the, there's two, en two exits from the rear uh, food preparation area. This happens to be both of those exits. And on any given day, they have the accumulation of trash and stuff back there. And when you think about it, if for some reason there's only three ways out of the building, and that's through the customer service area and through the food preparation area, if for some reason something happens in the front of the building, a car hits the building, which is very popular these days, and they can't get out through the front, and they have to exit through the back, they have some challenges there, all right? Especially when you look at this picture here, and you look to see where the the storage is at. Again, a fire inspection issue, it's in, fr in front of the main distribution panel. So things that we look at and we look at it differently, but we have to educate the people that are running these places. They're in the food service industry, they're not in the fire service. Now who wants to eat french fries coming out of that machine? Believe it or not, that's from that McDonald's restaurant by us. So we call the sanitarian after we pull that machine apart and he looks at it and he says, I'll be honest with you, that ain't that bad. Did you not? The guy's a good friend of mine. I go, are you serious? He goes, oh yeah, that's not bad. But that is, in this case, what they were doing is, I mean, that's just the, the residue from that process. Anybody ever work in a fast food restaurant? We're friends, let's raise your hand. Okay, what's the back, what, what's the flooring like in that place on a good day? Slippery. Slippery, all right, slippery. Now keep that in mind. What do we use most of the time to put fire out? Water. You probably learned way back in the day that oil and water don't mix, right? So we put oil on those naturally slippery floors and it's like an ice skating rink. It gets even worse. So that steel container you see on the bottom right there, that's the collection container for the old style oil distribution system. They would open up a valve and the oil would pour down the chute and it would fill that thing up right through there and then they would wheel that out and dump it, all right? So you have to keep in mind that these places are not fire service friendly. Right? That they don't know that. That's part of our role in educating them. That's what we should be doing. All right. <clears throat> I'll show you a little video here coming up from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And this is another one of those things that you wouldn't think about until you think about it. And I always call this the sharp poke in the temple. One of those things like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, that guy from Wisconsin pointed uh, this out. This road broke out just 20 minutes before opening time. KCRG TV today, Fransman is live to scene. Dave? Beth, the workers who were preparing to open up here this morning saw that smoke, saw the flames, and they got outside to safety. Now, as firefighters, though, were putting on the gear to go inside and fight that fire, that's when the building blew up. 
Firefighters don't know what. Notice the brick is ma missing from the back of the the back wall of the building there. There was a gas leak somewhere inside as well. The fire touched off the glass near seconds before firefighters were blown inside and attacked the flames. As they were a few feet away, there was an explosion that knocked the glass right out of the dining room windows. Also displaced the front door that they were heading towards. The force of the blast knocked one Cedar Rapids firefighter backwards, but he wasn't injured. The explosion also blew part of a back wall and collapsed parts of the ceiling. But despite the damage, the situation could have ended up a lot worse without some good luck. There were no customers inside at the time. The three workers did the right thing by leaving immediately and then calling for help. There's always a degree of luck involved. You can have <coughs> adequate training. The folks know what they're doing. They did the right thing again this morning, but it's just a matter of luck. It's 30 seconds. Um, you, you don't expect buildings to uh, have dining room windows and doors come off, you know, and, and explode while you're you're getting ready to make an interior fire attack. Investigators will check to see what started the fire and to try and locate the source of the gas line leak. <coughs> District manager for the franchise says the building is probably a total loss. Now, workers who were inside here when the fire broke out couldn't talk to a citing the company policy, though a manager says the people who were employed here will get jobs at other franchise locations. Live in Cedar Rapids, Dave. Yes. yes. All right, just another short video on that same fire after, a couple months after. I don't know why they put my name on the marquee there, but it was nice of them to do that. <laughs> Might not have caught that. The employees were out. Uh, we asked if the doors were locked. Uh, we said the bathroom was locked. We saw it smoldering on the corner of the front of the corner of the building here. The corner of the building where that brick was displaced. We would uh, first see, open that up and see if that was the extent of where the fire was. So we were opening it up with a hose line knocking it down. Once we got that accomplished, we thought we'd go inside and check out the interior. Good idea. We were getting our masks on because we, you know, the smoke bombs were going off. Uh, once we got our masks on, we were attempting to put our masks on. Uh, the, the entire side of the building glass blew out. And, and, uh, both my partner, Doug, uh, declared several times. He got out, he was fine. Uh, we continued putting a mask on. Went inside, uh, didn't see any visible flames. Uh, located the flames above the restroom area. And uh, continued just to expose and try and extinguish it. Didn't take long to uh, get it knocked out. It was a matter of uh, just exposing anything else in that fire. So nobody was injured in this fire, is that what I understand? That's correct. Talk about that explosion. I mean, it, it, you never really know what to expect, I suppose, when you're approaching something like this. No, I mean, last thing we figured was we just had a small fire. Possibly, they said planes coming from the roof. We expected maybe the exhaust system in restaurants like this occasionally get built up with grease. But uh, we didn't see anything other than a little bit of light smoke, probably from that. They're still teeing up. And uh, so, no, we didn't expect that explosion. We were just going to you know, mask up, go inside, see if there was an extension from this small fire in the corner. Everything from the ceiling, the fall ceiling was blown down, all the light fixtures, what have you. So we had a good view of the roof area without having to do any work other than in the bathroom. That was all very, very hard, uh, hard to drive all day. All right. So they look into the cause of this fire and they re as he mentions in that video that they have smoldering on that corner of the building it turns out that that is where obviously they can't smoke inside the restaurant so that is where the the entire staff that smoked would go out there and extinguish their cigarettes and forever they extinguished their cigarettes right in that corner in that that insulation material that was there in the t111 siding the the lightweight particle board siding and eventually that fire worked its way into that insulation board, worked its way up into the concealed space, and had been burning there for quite a while. Well, when they pulled that corner apart, they fed a little bit more oxygen into it. The fire was actually extending into the building. The gas explosion they had that they mentioned in that original one, it turned out to be a rapid fire progression is what it was. And push the ceiling down. And you're going to see another picture from a fire in Indianapolis, same thing. Push the ceiling down blew that one firefighter out. He did a couple of cartwheels or somersaults or whatever. Luckily, nobody was seriously injured. So again, one of those things that you may not think about, but obviously that whole pyrolysis thing, the P word we talk about, when you apply heat to something consistently and over a period of time, it reduces the ignition temperature. And in that case, the reduced ignition, ignition temperature and the right amount of oxygen caused it to 
to flare up, cause the fire. And that fire progressed up that lightweight insulation material up into the concealed space. All right? So another thing that we've been seeing a lot up by us uh, is fires in mulch outside of buildings. Matter of fact, in some areas there are uh, ordinances or local statutes that prohibit this uh, lightweight mulch, the shredded mulch, and even now the rubberized mulch, if you've seen that come into your community, that ignites fairly simply. When you went through Firefighter 1 class, they, they would show you a picture of you know, wood shavings and they'd show you a picture of a cube of wood and they talk about heat release rates and they talk about which one was easier to ignite. Well now we take that big cube of wood or pallets, sometimes wooden pallets, and we shred it down to make it decorative bark. So we have little strands. It doesn't take much to ignite. And under the right conditions, those fires are starting fairly easily. And when they start fairly easily, they progress quite rapidly, especially when they're in contact with the building. So one quick video here. Two alarms, remember that. Two alarms. Two alarms. So there are places, as I mentioned, that have, have banned it. Some of them have banned it within, content, or within so, uh, so many inches, 18, 24 inches, close to these buildings. Anybody have a fire uh, involving the uh, plastic or vinyl siding? We just had a fully involved detached garage fire Christmas Eve, actually, early in the morning, 4.30 or 4.15 in the morning. And there was a garage located 24 feet away across the alley that was totally melted, just from the heat transfer. No direct flame impingement whatsoever. It looked like somebody had taken a torch to that garage and melted. That lightweight vinyl siding burns so incredibly fast and distorts and melts and spreads fire. Right next to it, less than eight feet away on the adjoining property was a steel-sided garage with not a lick of damage to it. Unbelievable, not unbelievable, we know that. So keep this in mind when you're, when you're pre-planning your community and maybe even you know, mentioning to people, you might not wanna have that, that mulch right up to your vinyl siding. You might not wanna have that rubberized mulch. We've had fires in the rubberized mulch started by uh, lamps, lamps that are embedded in the ground that light up a flagpole, that they, the mulch ends up getting on top of it and starts to rubber mulch on fire. So that can spread quite rapidly. Think about it, it's shredded car tires. If you've ever seen car tires burn. Uh, real quick here, other intentional causes, obviously vandalism. Uh, in the Houston case, those punks, I'll call them, they ended up going to jail. Um, they killed Kim Smith and Louis Mayo III were covering up their robbery attempt. Revenge, quite a bit of that going on. Now I think the, you know, the focus more is on active assailant or active shooter. You know, people coming back and are, are not happy with their employers. Uh, but certainly fire is not out of the question these days. And then to fraud, the defraud the uh, insurance companies, obviously one of them. Hate crimes and protests, <clears throat> animal extremist groups. Uh, one of the things that's noteworthy about this, these pictures are from uh, out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Bobby Halton, when he was uh, deputy chief out there, sent me these pictures. And, and uh, they had three arson fires in one night, two McDonald's and a uh, Burger King. And I th yeah, Burger King. And uh, as you can see on that McDonald's restaurant there, they like to take credit for what they do. And I'm not sure if they're active in your area, but they are certainly active in the north woods of Wisconsin and uh, oftentimes in the areas that are being developed. And I understand about the, the great development that's going on around here. But they like to take credit for what they do. And there you can see, now I'm no cop again, but he's going to dust that that payphone there and find fingerprints. And I'll bet you I know whose fingerprints he's gonna find out in the coin return. It's gonna be the engineer on the engine because he's checking for a quarter or something. That's a typical fireman, that's what we do. That's what we do. So, uh, and somebody tap them on the corner, or on, the, on the shoulder, they could point out that somebody spray painted some stuff. But they do take credit for what they do. You can go to their website. I wouldn't suggest you doing that work because you'll probably be walked out by human resources. But I would, uh, you know, take a look at that. They like to take credit for what they do, all right? All right, so let's take a look at the buildings themselves, all right? And I have written on the bottom here something that I firmly believe in. If you want to know how they come apart when attacked by fire, you better learn how they're put together before the fire, okay? And I think that is one of the fundamental things we need to teach every firefighter that walks into our firehouse is building construction. Building construction, 
fire behavior, smoke travel, all of those things, the fundamentals, and ladders and hoses and all that other stuff. But they have to understand how these buildings are constructed to understand how they are destructed when attacked by fire. Okay, extremely important. So here is a lumber yard that has been fastened together. Now keep this in mind. Anybody recognize the name Frank Brannigan? Everybody should, right? Frank Brannigan, guy was awesome. May he rest in peace. But the, father of, the grandfather of building construction used to call this thing that keeps the ceiling from falling on our head the GRS, the gravity resistance system. Think about it. As we stand and sit here right now, this building wants to fall on our heads, right? Gravity works. You can't defeat gravity down here. Some of us think we do after a few cocktails, but you can't defeat gravity on Earth, right, under, under normal circumstances. This roof, this ceiling wants to fall on our heads. But there is a man-made system designed, engineered, and constructed by human beings with human hands that keeps it from falling on our head. So all of that lumber that's in that Culver's restaurant under construction there used to lay in a big pile somewhere. Used to be in a tree. They took it out of the tree and put it in the lumber yard and the lumber yard delivered it and put it in a big pile out in the mud. And people like you and I strapped on a tool belt and put that building together. So if that's any reassurance when you go to bed tonight and you look up at the ceiling, remember that if that person was having a bad Monday or a bad Friday or a bad life, that this building is being held together by something that's been designed, engineered, constructed by human beings, all right? Fortunately, in most cases, they do a pretty darn good job, and it stays upright, but not always. And it stays upright under normal, typical conditions. It's when it's attacked by fire that that changes. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the uh, impact of studies and laboratory tests. So one of the things I've thrown in here recently is we had a, a fire up in, it was actually up right over the border, Wisconsin-Michigan border, in a mixed-use property like this, okay? If you look closely, you can see that this mobile station has a Burger King in it, and the pilot gas station behind it has a McDonald's, right back here, a McDonald's in it, and these mixed-use buildings are becoming more and more prominent, all right? The extraordinary images coming in here at home. Firefighters tackling a potentially deadly blaze at a gas station. When take a look, part of the building collapsed, trapping a firefighter, setting off a frantic rescue. All unfolding as cameras were rolling. Here's ABC's Adrian Bay. Oh my God! Oh my God! It happened in one heart-stopping moment. This convenience store engulfed in flames. The front of the building collapses, crushing a firefighter at this Michigan gas station. Get him out, get him out, get him out. Cameras He's in there. As flames rage around him, burning dangerously close to gas pumps. The firefighter trapped under the debris, more than half a dozen first responders frantic. Adrenaline pumping, lifting that metal frame, desperately trying to pull him out, some with their bare hands. Another dousing flames with a fire hose. Witnesses calling for help, shocked by what's unfolding in front of them. Just two and a half minutes later. Applause as the man is pulled out, amazingly seen up and walking around. He's standing, so okay, thank God. All right, so keep in mind that if you have those buildings, that's part of that whole pre-planning thing, that the hazards are going to be the same. If they're selling Burger King food, if they're selling McDonald's food, they're preparing it somewhere. Inside that building are go is going to be the same type of hazards, same construction features that we see in the lightweight, freestanding, constructed places. So let's talk about what's above our heads first. All right. Now, as I did my research on this, on this presentation and in building construction, which is one of my main focuses in life, is I looked at these, these ceiling tiles, suspended ceiling tile systems, and really they serve three purposes. Number one being aesthetics. When that owner of the restaurant or this hotel, this conference center, wants to impress the public, they cover up everything with these nice ceiling tile systems. I get that. That's what they do. They want to make it presentable. They don't want to make it so that Mr. and Mrs. Smith walk through the room and, or walk into the room and go, oh, this is terrible. I'm not going to have a party here. I'm not going to have a conference here. However, that Burger King I showed you with the oil storage in it, uh, when they built that, it goes back a little over two years ago, when they opened it up, it was one of eight like it in the country. In the front end of it, 
where they, believe it or not, there's an effort to upscale these restaurants. If you have any McDonald's restaurants that have been upscaled, they're putting fireplaces in them, they're putting granite tile, they're putting flat screen TVs. In this Burger King, it was the industrial look. They left the parallel cord trusses exposed, spray painted them gunmetal gray, and it's, there's no ceiling tile system in there. When they were, the, we attended the grand opening, we were invited to the ribbon cutting, so we go there and the manager tells me, he says, you know, chief, if you ever wanna bring your command staff down here and have a meeting, you're welcome. And I said, you know, I, no disrespect, but if I ever suggest to my command staff that we're going to have an a officer meeting down here, you'll probably find me out in a dumpster somewhere because they don't want to go there if I'm going to. They don't want me taking them to a Burger King for a meeting, that's for sure. So aesthetics is a big thing for them. It doesn't really matter for us. Environmental control is a big thing for them. They want to keep the air conditioning that they're putting into this room in the room and not escaping or heat, vice versa, okay? That's not necessarily a big thing for us. But it does relate to the third thing, and that's fire resistance. They do make these commercial tiles, and they're not the same tiles that, that you can buy for you know, a, a dollar and a half at Home Depot or Menards or any of those home centers, but some of these tiles actually have surface burning characteristic ratings and fire resistance ratings. The whole idea is that if a fire starts down here, it stays down here. Or if a fire starts above it, unfortunately, it stays above it as well. And unless that concealed space is sprinklered, it's not gonna get to the sprinkler system, which is below it like this, okay? So we have to understand these void spaces. This happens to be a medical office that's under renovation directly across from my firehouse. And in one day, they lower that ceiling about three feet, I think it was 34 inches, as you can see. They drop down to HVAC, they put some light fixtures in there, and then they put the ceiling tiles in. So what does that create for us? That creates a very large void space that leads to large uncontrolled fires. If fire gets up, that is not a sprinklered area in that building. That building is not sprinklered. It's grandfathered. So if fire gets up into that void space, it is going to be burning up there unchecked, like it did in Boston, without anybody knowing about it, without impacting the sprinkler system if there was one. So we have to know that during our pre-planning efforts, all right? The aesthetic part of it is real simple. It's to hide this stuff. It's to hide everything that's above our heads. That's the aesthetic aspect of it, all right? On the right there is a picture of one of my former firefighters. We have an acquired structure and we're doing some entanglement hazes, some SCBA drills. And right at that point when I snapped that picture, you can see he's got the old three-piece paratech tool that's now a doorstop in the firehouse, but he, give, he gives up. He goes into this entanglement maze like a bull in a china shop. Doesn't pay attention to our training. We tell them how to go there, where to position their body, where to put their tank, how to do this, how to swim, all of that. He goes in there, and if you look real closely, this is a few years back, many years back actually, when we used to wear the steel tanks, all right? And right behind his steel tank, in between the back plate and the steel tank, is a wire that is jammed, lodged in there. So when he gives up his efforts to get out of there, he says, he yells out, that's it, I'm done. I snap the picture, we get him out of there. He calls BS to me. He drops a few expletives and he says, that's, he gets a, his first look at this. He's, his mask is obscured here. And he says, that's ridiculous. There's no way I'm ever gonna encounter that. You built this training scenario for failure. And I said, you know what? Come back to my office. And go back to my office and I show him pictures of the Indianapolis Fire Department slides. I show them pictures of, oh, let me go back to the other one. I show them pictures of the one on the right there of an actual fire in a fast food restaurant where the wires have dropped down. Anybody ever see any uh, electricians wire that low voltage wiring? They are not very precise with their measurements. If it's 40 feet from here to that wall, they might use 80 feet of wire. They don't care because it's quicker and they get it done. And that's okay, that's their business. I don't do that business, all right? So we didn't build it for failure. We built it for reality, all right? This is just recently, two nights ago, in that, in that uh, the fire up in Connecticut, an article that was in Fire Engineering Magazine, one firefighter became entangled in the wires that held the grid for the ceiling tiles. Members used wire cutters to remove the firefighter from further harm. So if you know anything about the ceiling tile system, that is a fairly rigid spring steel wire that they use to suspend it, which is much different than communications data cables and cable TV wires and that. It's much more rigid. 
So I always segue into a little, make sure you know what's in your pockets. If you're carrying something in your pockets that you intend to use to save your life, make sure with your gloves on and zero visibility, you can dig that out of your pockets and you can use it to cut those wires. If it's a Leatherman tool on your gut belt that you think you're going to be able to use with gloves on and zero visibility and cut something substantial, chances are good that's not going to work. So you and your members of your department, when you're training like that, you have to train for success. You have to make sure you're carrying the right stuff in your pockets. This is that picture from Indianapolis I talked about. And this is a snapshot or a screenshot out of the, the NIOSH report. <coughs> Kim Smith was found six feet to the west side of the rear steel door. She was found entangled in wires and a pair of wire cutters, believed to be hers, were found nearby. So she was entangled six feet from the rear door. The chance of survival for her, or the chance of rescue had they known where she was at, had they possibly softened the building, and we'll talk about that here shortly, would have been great. She was within earshot of that back door. She ran out of air. Her mask was dislodged. She was entangled in wires. Within reach, a pair of wire cutters. She had the wherewithal to carry wire cutters, but she couldn't get herself out. All right. We're going to talk about our obligation as incident commanders. All right. We talk about ingress and egress on these buildings. <clears throat> we have to admit that this is an inherently risky business we do. It's dangerous when we allow it to become dangerous, when we either accept the risk, we assume the risk, or we ignore the risk. Then it becomes dangerous. Okay? So there is risk involved every time we roll out the door. Company and chief officers have a duty and an obligation to provide for as safe a work environment as possible because allowing unsafe actions is totally, totally unacceptable. Now take a look at that picture. And of course, I'm being somewhat critical here, but just to the, if you see that firefighter climbing into that window, I have it highlighted and colorized here. They're climbing into that window. Why, I don't know. They're climbing in that window with a two and a half or a three inch line. Why, I don't know. Well, I do know. I mean, they want to put water on a fire, obviously. It's that whole GPM over BTU equation again. But right next to it, right next to it is what? A door. A door. Now, I am a big proponent of softening buildings. Anybody know what I mean when I say softening buildings? Let's open those buildings up. Somehow, not take the glass necessarily. We know now what about flow paths and everything else. Let's not take the glass as much as, let's get that door open. Let's force that lock. Let's use a K tool, go through the cylinder. Let's take a saw and cut that throw off that lock, off the latch. Let's somehow soften that so if things go south, Somebody's not trying to jump out that window, all right? So let's go back to that video and the, the screenshot I mentioned <clears throat> in the video from American Heat in Houston. There's those two firefighters. That's the volume of fire above their heads. Why are they going into that building and why are they going into that building without the protection of a hose line? Who's in that building right now? Louis Mayo III and Kim Smith. Another thing of the, the mantra of the American Fire Service, we don't leave anyone behind, right? We do desperate things during desperate times, and that's what they're doing. You saw the videotape. Those two firefighters, that officer and firefighter, are going into that building to attempt a rescue. They have no idea where they're at. They were totally separated. Lewis Mayo was right behind the counter, trapped under a 20,000 pound HVAC unit. Kim Smith was six feet from the back door, totally separated. Maybe it was only 20 feet, 20, 30 feet, but they were separated. These firefighters are going in there without the protection of a hose line with that volume of fire above their head because they are going to try to make a valiant attempt to save their brother and sister firefighter. We as command officers not only have to soften that building and prepare, for a, prepare the building for a safer, if you can call it safer, work environment, but we also have to command that fire so that we don't allow this type as well. At some point, we have to say, wait a minute, let's do this the right way, okay? So this is the door that, that uh, Kim Smith and Lewis Mayo stretched the line through, and we know that because in the NIOSH report, there it is. They chose to take the glass. You see the hose line is running through the doorway here, right there. <clears throat> 
you know, hit or miss, whatever. If you want to take the glass, then I guess that's your call. It's just that you, you lose control. You can't unbreak glass. That's the thing. Once you make that commitment, you can't unbreak glass. But you can close the door if you need to. Right? If you need to control the flow path or whatever, you can control the door. You can close it. So there's a panic bar on there. What would it take to take that panic bar out of it? If you choose to take the glass and you're going to go that way, what would it take to take that panic bar, panic bar hardware out of there? Big, strong person on a truck company with a mall or a flathead ax or something, right? You've already done damage to the building. You're already burning the building. The reason you're going to take it out is for the safety and survival of our firefighters. I will stand in front of any property owner and say, yes, the reason we damage your door is because I don't want to kill one of my firefighters. Talk to your insurance company. Sorry, but that's just the way it has to be, right? So here's a fire in a Pizza Hut restaurant. And if you look closely, you can see there's one firefighter doing the limbo, trying to come out of there. Things are starting to go south. Things are starting to look not so good, and they're deciding to get out of there. There's a line back there. Take a number. There's a line to get out. How hard would it be to take that? Now, they took the glass. Okay, whatever. I wouldn't recommend it, but they did it. How hard would it be to take that push bar out of there? Not hard at all, right? One good smack with a sledge or a flat-headed axe or a halligan, that'll take that out of there. Which means if they're coming out of there in a hurry, they don't have to do the limbo like that to get out of there. They can, get, they can make their way out without having to manipulate themselves. They wouldn't have a buildup of people in the background there. All right, let's talk a little bit about the storage inside. <clears throat> have you ever been to one of these restaurants and not received your product in something that was made out of paper, plastic, styrofoam, or cardboard? No. Not at all. They always, they, whatever you buy, they're putting in paper, plastic, styrofoam, or cardboard. That's just the way it is. That's the way it is. So they have to store it somewhere. Everything I just mentioned there, paper, plastic, styrofoam, and cardboard, is combustible, right? And there's a lot of combustibles. There's a lot of stuff that adds to the heat release rate. This is an unsprinkler McDonald's in my city. They just recently, without us knowing, had installed these sliding storage racks. There used to be aisles between all the racks. Now, like medical records, they slide back and forth. They were so proud of it. So that's really good, with the exception of it's an unsprinkler building, and NFPA 1, which is our model fire code, says you can't have that stuff chock full, or, oops, up against the ceiling like that. All right? So you, you end up losing that top shelf. Sorry to break the news to you. And that's one of the things then we educate them on. Here's why you need that ceiling tile system in place. Here's why you can't store things up there. This is that Burger King restaurant. Look closely. As I'm there at that Burger King restaurant in the back with that little smoke coming from the wall call, <coughs> excuse me, I turn the corner and I see where their storage is at, and I happen to look up in their storage and I see this. And as I'm educating the property owner, the manager, assistant manager, as to why she can't keep eight inches of oil in that garbage can back there, I also say, let me give you a little lesson on fire behavior. If somebody would not be happy with work or an accident takes place, an unintentional fire, and that rack starts on fire, where is the products of combustion going to go? Up and where? Into the concealed space, right? Up into that concealed space. And then we have Boston and then we have Houston all over again. So keep that in mind as you pre-plan these places, as you visit these places. Maybe you're there on an EMS support call or whatever. If you're in there and you see that, <clears throat> it gives us an opportunity to educate these people. Same thing here. This is the back room of a McDonald's restaurant in my city. This is at the transition time. This is actually a picture taken prior before they served all day breakfast there. But this is at the transition time between the breakfast crowd and the lunch crowd. <clears throat> So if you take a look at the additional combustibles that are in there, you can see the one arrow on the, on the far left shows you the, the cup storage above the customer service area, the, the counters, the checkout registers are right up there, all of the buns and everything else on these movable plastic carts. This preparation table is on, on wheels. This warming oven is on wheels. It's on wheels because why? Yeah, ideally they're cleaning this place every day or throughout the day or whatever. I'm hoping that happens. Now, we talked earlier, you have an inherently slippery floor simply from the products of cooking. 
Now you add water to it when we stretch a line in there. Now you put us in big, cumbersome fire gear. Now you give us limited visibility. And now the places that we would be using as a purchase point, right, as a point to, to help us hump hose and so on, is going to be moving away from us. So it makes for Sunday funnies when you have a fire in these places. Things to keep in mind as you pre-plan them, right? Additional storage, and if you think about this, the, the picture on the uh, upper right-hand corner is actually a manager's office in a McDonald's restaurant. If you would take out one of those ceiling tiles there and start that corner of combustibles on fire, that would quickly load up that concealed space, the void space above the ceiling tile with combustible gases, and eventually when it gets to the right fuel-air mixture and finds an ignition source, you're going to have the same problem we had. This is the manager's office where they started the arson fire in Houston. Very similar circumstances, maybe not even that amount of combustibles with that type of heat release rate when you talk about plastics and polyurethane foam and so on and so forth. So things to keep in mind as you walk through these buildings, right? Temporarily blocked aisles. An indoor playground, something that I refer to as probably the most volatile room in the indoor structure. This is an unsprinkler building. <clears throat> you have things in this picture right here that are made out of foam rubber, plastic, styrofoam, vinyl, all combustible. <clears throat> do they make them non-combustible? Well, they sure do, but they don't usually install them. Why? Because they cost too much. It's cost prohibitive. And they don't think they're going to have fires. But if little Johnny gets a hold of a big lighter and lights up that foam rubber that's around, and the vinyl that's around one of these headbanging posts, next thing you know, that fire spreads, we're going to be in trouble. All right? We're going to be in trouble. So as I'm taking this picture, I notice something out of the corner of my eye that you can't see in this picture, <clears throat> but you can see here. There's a ceiling tile out of place. And I'm walking around with the maintenance guy. And I said, all right, tell me, what's the story behind that? And he mumbles a few expletives underneath his breath. And he says, those darn kids, they climb that webbing and they throw the balls from the ball pit across the ceiling tile. You go, ah, get out of here. He goes, no, seriously. And you'll see a picture later on. Matter of fact, if you look closely, you can see little fingerprints up there. I don't know if that's ketchup or what, but you can see little fingerprints up there. And I said, so now I'm with the maintenance guy. I explain him, I, I use that as a teaching moment. This is why you have to have that ceiling tile system in place. He said, well, just short of me gluing that tile in there, I don't know what to do. Bingo. Go to the hardware store. Get some construction, construction adhesive. Just put a few tabs in there. Some little six-year-old kid or eight-year-old kid isn't going to climb that webbing and, or that, that netting and use a lot of energy to push that tile aside. So if you have to glue them down, glue them down, whatever. We can't have a fire progressing up into that concealed space. So voila, another teaching moment, all right? That's a playground, excuse me, playground gym set or whatever you want to call it, playground equipment burning, and the combustible mulch. Think about enclosing that, all right? And then give this some thought. Anybody got any little kids, like a five-year-old, six-year-old? Anyone? You can admit that too. Anybody? Nobody's got kids in here? All right. What's your name? Andy. Andy, Andy son or daughter? Son, how old's your son? Seven. Seven? Does he like you? Yeah. That'll change. That'll change. Trust me. Trust me. I have a 28 and a 30 year old. I have a two and a half year old grandson. He loves me to death. But I know that'll change too. So, what, Andy, what's your son's name? Caden. Caden? So, Caden's going to, you're going to have a birthday party for Caden because Caden likes you right now. If you don't have a birthday party, that's when it starts to change and he don't like you. Caden have friends? All right. Does friends like you? So far, right? All right, let's work with me on this. All right, Andy, so you're going to go to this Burger King on a Sunday, and you're going to have a little birthday party for Caden with five of Caden's little friends. And you show up there, and you're, they're having a great all time, and all of a sudden, the fire starts. And at the end of this presentation today, you're going to see a lessons learned thing, that we're going to look at another play place in the McDonald's. But there's a fire that started in the Burger King, and now this playland here starts to fill up with smoke. And Andy takes Caden and all of his little friends out in the parking lot to wait for the, the fire trucks to show up. And while he's out there, he notices that little Billy, for example, isn't with you. All right, one of, one of your son's friends is not, didn't make it out of there. 
And you ask everybody, hey, where's little Billy? And they say, well, last time we saw little Billy, he was up in that yellow thing up there and he was playing. But we don't have little Billy anymore. So when the fire engine shows up and the company officer steps off, Andy, if he likes little Billy, is going to tell us that little Billy's not with the crew, right? What do we do in the American Fire Service? We go look for little Billy. How do we look for little Billy in this structure? Who wants to volunteer to crawl in there? High heat conditions, banking down smoke, things aren't going well. How do we search this? What do we do in the American Fire Service? Say it again. Possibly a thermal imaging camera. Can we use it from the outside? You're going to get reflection off the glass, right? Chances are we're not going to get a heat signature. So we might have to get in there and take a look at it. Thermal imaging camera. In Houston, at the time of their fire, that was one of the, criti the criticisms they faced. Well, why didn't you go in there and look at a, a thermal imaging camera? Because the first couple of companies didn't have them at the time. Now they do, but they didn't have them. Like the third do truck had it, or third do engine had it. They didn't have it at the time. But that, we still got to get in there to use that, right? I don't think anybody really wants to. Now what happens if little Billy's up there? You take the thermal imaging camera and you walk in and you go, oh, there's a heat signature. I need to, how are we going to get little Billy out? This might very well be the slide that you remember when you pull in the drive through for that cup of coffee. And you look over and you say, holy crap, how would I, what would I do if I'm standing out here running command and that's full of smoke and I got a report that little Billy's in there? American Fire Service, right? It's not vacant until we say it's vacant. It's not empty until we say it's empty. So this might very well be one of those things. So fortunately, Andy likes little Billy. Andy goes in there and makes sure little Billy comes out with Caden and we live happily ever after. But that might not be the scenario, so keep that in mind, all right? They also, when they design these buildings, you know, think about that fire I showed you earlier on the outside playland and put it as a, as a direct exposure to the restaurant itself. It limits access to us, which is not going to make for a fun day if it's, if it's automatically exposing direct fire impingement and so on on the structure itself. So they don't, they don't always build them to suit our needs, all right? Now let's go all the way up on top and look up at the HVAC equipment. Usually, and I say usually because you'll see a different slide here coming up next, the largest concentration of HVAC stuff is above the food preparation area, usually or normally. And that's because that's where the heat's being produced, all right? Now the new standard for the upblast ventilators, those vents that I have labeled there, is that they're directly above the appliance that they're going to be serving. That's for new construction. But there's a lot of retrofitting going on out there, a lot of old style buildings, like this one. This is kind of a panoramic view on the, the rooftop of a McDonald's restaurant in my city, in my jurisdiction. Right? One of the very few that has interior access to the roof as well. There's a pull down stairway that goes up there. Very few have that as well. They have the cat ladders, as I call them, bolted to the back of it. All right. This is one of those anomalies. This is a Burger King, or I mean a Hardee's restaurant in a neighboring community right on the border of two of my neighbors that I go mutual aid to. And they actually changed the configuration of this place. They changed where the, where the, the seating was and so on, but they left the, the HVAC stuff alone because it would be too expensive to modify the roof structure. So the largest concentration in this Hardee's restaurant is above the dining area actually. Food prep takes, care, takes place in the back here and the seating area is in the front. All right. Now I have a quick note up there about additional dead load, which isn't too bad. A little direct TV antenna and, and three cinder blocks, but that's not always the case. All right. A friend of mine was doing a, a pub ed thing, and uh, they were up on the top of their 100 foot aerial doing a little demonstration or whatever for the kids, and happened to notice this, uh, on top of a strip mall there, happened to notice the satellite dish. So if you do the rough math, another 720 pounds, plus the weight of the dish and the platform and whatever. Now, not that that's a lot, you know, not that that's a big deal, but it's, unless we pre-plan the building, it's unanticipated dead load, something that can come down on top of our heads, all right? And I point out that satellite dish because you see the satellite dish that, in this picture, but what I have highlighted is an HVAC unit. It's a fire from the city of Kenosha, which is, if you ever come up to Wisconsin and you travel I-94 northbound, uh, th from Chicago to Milwaukee, it's the main interstate that comes up there. There's an empty grass-filled lot right now where this, this um, Long John Silver's restaurant used to be. And some very good friends in Kenosha, one of them a battalion chief, and sent me some pictures from this fire several years ago. And Kenosha Fire gets a report of a fire in this uh, restaurant 
with fire coming through the roof. It's about two o'clock in the morning. So they roll in there and sure enough, the first in report by that company officer is, you know, Kenosha engine one's on the scene. We got fire showing through the roof. We're gonna be stretching a bumper line through the rear entrance. So you'll see the rear entry shortly. But there's Kenosha engine one, fire through the roof, and if you look closely at the front of the engine, you see a bumper line coming up. I'm not here to argue tactics as much as I am to educate y'all this morning. How do you like that southern draw? Uh, y'all this morning, not all y'all actually, not just y'all, but all y'all. And so here's Kenosha engine one, and they're on the scene. Now pay attention to that HVAC, that air handler up there, because the very next picture is from the Kenosha fire department the next day, and there's that air handler. And there's the rear entrance they stretched the line through. Now, luckily, nothing bad happened. They went in, they put the fire out. A week later, the bulldozers were there. This happened to be an arson fire, a fraud fire. Filed a, a fraudulent insurance claim. Guy ended up going to jail for it, going to prison for it. But nonetheless, it's a grassy lot now. But they stretched the line through that back door because it was an opportunity. It was convenient. It was there. Okay. Now, right or wrong, that's what we often do. What I'm saying is when you look at these buildings, when I teach strategy and tactics, on-scene arrival reports, I tell people you have to do a 360 plus. We always preach 360s, but you have to do a 360 plus. You have to see what's on all four sides, and you've got to look above your head and below you. And we, and we have a directive by us that every fire is a basement fire until you prove differently. We lost a guy by the name of Arnie Wolf up in Green Bay, Wisconsin in a McMansion fire that fell in and was killed in the fire. And ever since then, we've said, you make sure that fire is not below you when you're going above it. Every fire is a basement fire until proven otherwise. So here they know there's no basement, but they didn't really pay attention to what was burning or what was above their head. And if you look closely at the fire damage there, you can see that they had a fire. It ended up burning the roof off the place, but they had a fire in that concealed space because you can see the soot staining and the fire travel there. All right. So, best case scenario is what happened. They stretch a line, pop the door off the hinges, stretch a line in there, go put the fire out, go home the next morning, high five, have coffee, return from their shift, hug their loved ones, and they get home. Lesser desirable outcome would be that there's a collapse up there, and it cuts off their means of egress out of the building. Or it cuts off their hose line and shuts down their water supply. Or worse yet, like in the ca case of, of Louis Mayo III, it collapses on top of them. So there are times when we do that 360 plus that we might have to say, you know, I'm standing right here eight feet from that back door, but that's not how we're going in there. We're gonna have to stretch. We can always stretch more line, right? We can always add a section if we have to. Man, I, I, see, I see companies with 400 foot pre-connects. You can park three lots over and still get a 400 pre-connect into this building. So keep that in mind. If you're the person charged with the responsibility as a company officer or chief officer to run these fires, to make the initial position decisions, initial attack decisions, you may have to use an unconventional or unorthodox way of getting in there simply to preserve or protect the lives of your men and women that are fighting fires, the interior crews. So keep that in mind, all right? Now this is a McDonald's restaurant, a neighboring community, and they built a brand new restaurant and they kind of jammed on this big two-story play place in the front. When they opened it up in mid-June, grand opening, ribbon cutting, the whole thing, they realized quite quickly that when they engineered it, they engineered it to use the HVAC system from the original restaurant into that building and found out that it was woefully underrated. That they, it was like a terrarium. They were growing ferns in that place. It was so hot, Tarzan couldn't stand it. They were, they were heating that place up because of all the glass. So after the fact, they decide to add it, their own air handler. Now I'm taking the, the two pictures that you see here. I'm standing on top of the play place, taking the picture on the upper left, and I'm across the street on the bottom one. And if you look in the one on the bottom right, you'll see a little black square up there in the corner. That is that air handler that's pictured in the upper left picture. And they plumb the ductwork into the building, which you'll see in an upcoming picture. So my first question to the owner, this is one of the 13 that he owns, is how are you sure that that roof structure was designed for that? Oh, because the engineers told me it was. And the check's in the mail, or whatever. Okay, well maybe it was, I got that. But they built the, the structure of the play place in such a fashion, uh, fiscally responsible, economically cheap, but they built it so lightweight that it would not support additional weight, and you'll see why. There's the roof structure. 
of that play place. It could not withstand without major modifications any more weight above it than it was calculated in for the snow load and the snow density up in Wisconsin. Fort Worth did a study on those on the corrugated steel roofing. You can see that without the proper support, it's inherently weak. The bottom picture on the right there shows you that. So if you look at those those trusses on the in the picture, the big picture there, how how far apart do you think they are? Any ideas? I hear six feet? Yeah, they're about six feet. And the reason I know that is because when I'm on that roof taking a picture on that bright sunny day, I could tell you exactly by doing this where that, where that parallel cord truss was at. If I did this three feet over and I did this, the roof went like that on a good day, on a good day. I would suggest that an inexperienced person would say, boy, this roof is spongy already. We hear that a lot, the roof is spongy. That roof was spongy on a good sunny day. That's why they couldn't put any more weight up there. Right? That's part of that whole pre-planning thing. Remember I promised to show you the little the balls that they throw out of the ball pit? There they are, no kidding. That's parallel cord steel roll bar uh, trusses. Pretty strong, they will withstand a lot of heat, but they will fail, correct? They'll fail. What happens when you heat these things up? They twist, they turn, they contort, they do all sorts of things. But they, for the most part, unless it's a heavy volume of fire, they still will be very strong. It's when we start dealing with mixed opportunities like this, a steel and wood truss uh, style, like they use down here in Pike, Towns uh, Pike Township in a Bob Evans restaurant. Uh, this is old technology that they have brought forward again. This is how they fail. What they do is they take a piece of structural dimensional lumber and they cut a this is a, an IFSTA picture here. They cut a dado or a groove down the middle. So they had a piece of structurally strong lumber that they've cut down the middle and make it weak in one plane. Then they shoot a hole through in another direction and make it weak in another plane. So they take in a piece of dimensional lumber. And remember, in, in this business, in building construction, mass is our friend. They're removing that mass. And then they take a piece of steel tubing basically electrical conduit with the ends flattened. They put it in there and they throw a pin through. Well, what happens to steel when it's exposed to heat? What does it do with the heat that it exposed to? It absorbs it, right? And it absorbs it and then it transmits it. And it transmits it to the wood. And it causes that P word, pyrolysis, and it causes what used to be a strong piece of wood that now has been weakened in two separate planes to weaken even further. And when you look at that picture of the old school failure, you'll see exactly where they failed, right at that pin joint. And then you look at a, a new school failure, kind of hard in the lighting, but you can see exactly where those pins were at. All right, the steel didn't fail. The steel accumulated the heat, transmitted it, transferred it to the wood. The wood pyrolysizes, the wood fails, the wood weakens, the wood collapses. All right, typical failure of that type. Right? Truss roofs are very popular. This is that z same design. Uh, I believe this restaurant is about 38 feet wide. And that the roof on the far right of that picture is 42 inches high and it tapers to the other side because they have internal piping, rain gutters basically, that take the water off the flat roof. Right? A good friend of ours, Miami-Dade Captain Bill Gustin, if everybody knows Bill Gustin, the guy's a genius, been in the ser fire service a long time. He and I were down at a conference once and we were talking about my presentation and he said, I was showing him some of my pictures and you'll see one of them coming up and he says, well, we don't really fight many fires in balloon construction buildings anymore because we don't see balloon constructed buildings anymore for a long time, meaning vertical balloon construction. He says, but what you're showing me is nothing more than balloon construction laid on its side. You think about it, he's absolutely right. That fire can travel from the left of this building to the right of that building in there with no fire stopping in between. So we're taking balloon construction now and we're laying it on its side. Similar setup in McHenry Township, Illinois. Same type of trusses, new construction, except they're using engineered lumber now instead of the dimensional lumber, the natural lumber I talked about earlier. Where they cut the groove in there, no more groove. They took, take two pieces and they sandwich the metal in between it. So now that envelope is created for the heat to build up in between those where the steel is at.
I'm a code guy. I'm a fine print guy. Uh, my wife refers to me as a firehouse lawyer because I like to read the fine print of them. And in that very colorful uh, publication there, flyer from the Trust Choice Company, they, uh, Firefax Guide they call it, there's a quote in fine print on the back that says, one dimensional charring test of structural composite lumber products confirmed that charring of these products may be considered comparable with solid wood. All right, raise your hand if you've been to a one dimensional fire. I thought this was gonna be the place, Chief. I thought for sure this was gonna be the place. We don't go to one dimensional fires, right? Mrs. Smith doesn't call us and say, I'm reporting a one dimensional fire in my neighbor's shed across the street. One dimensional means it is affecting one plane of the product. Now in the test laboratory, if my hand is a two by four and I flick my bick here and I put a flame right here, that is a one dimensional fire. It is impacting one plane of that product. Do we go to fires like that? No. The fires build, they envelop the entire thing. We go to multi-dimensional fires. Mrs. Smith doesn't call that in either, right? She just says, boy, my shed, the shed's on fire in my backyard or my neighbor's yard. So what they're saying is not untrue, but I call it lawyer speak or legalese. One-dimensional charring test. If I take engineered lumber and I put a lighter to it right here, a flame to it right here, that layer of the engineered lumber is gonna burn or char. I like my steaks charred, I don't go to garage chars, I go to garage fires or house fires. It's going to char at the same rate as a two by four is. Can't, you cannot deny that, you can't argue that. What does it mean to us? Nothing, thank you, nothing. All right, parallel cord trusses, dimensional lumber, probably the strongest roof system of, these are two by six top and bottom cords with two by four web members, very strong, but they're subject to failure. And what fails first in these? The gusset plates, the truss plates, right? If you know anything about trusses, you know they're built on the theory of the triangle. That's where they get their strength and energy from. So this is a, a couple of pictures from a garage fire we had, another garage fire. Let's get a lot of garage fires by me. And this, is, you can see if you look closely where that truss plate was at. It accumulated the heat, it transferred or transmitted the heat to the wood, it caused the rapid pyrolysis, and because they're put in under pressure, when they're put in under pressure, they release under pressure. And they release under pressure by popping those plates out of there. So technically, technically, that truss has not failed yet because the three components are still in place. But a good stiff breeze or a you know, movement by a, the firefighters or overhaul or whatever could cause that to fail. Inside that garage and inside the, the fishing boat that was inside there was a, like a half dozen or more of those truss plates just laying everywhere. Just popped out of there. They're put in under pressure, they release under pressure. Those, those gusset plates or truss places, plates, that's where they fail. Right? This is from that Fire Engineering Magazine article that uh, just came out last month actually. Once visibility improved, crews determined that the roof above the kitchen area was wood truss and deemed it immediately unsafe. You can see how that truss plate was pulled away there, how that gusset plate was pulled away. The lumber's still there, there's still material there, not necessarily the best material, but there's still stuff there. Mass is our friend, right? remember that. So they use them for concealed spaces. This is about three days worth of work in a McDonald's under under construction. This is where you have to have a handshake agreement with your building inspector, uh, inspection department to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to doing with the fire stopping that's in there. The fire stopping is required, they should be in there. The problem is we get people that, uh, electricians or whomever, that poke holes in there to run their wiring, it has to be covered up, otherwise that fire stopping is useless, all right? This was a project going on in Tinley Park, Illinois. Forest Reader, the chief there, a very good friend of mine. Uh, he sent me these pictures. Their inspection bureau was out, and they were upscaling their McDonald's. So the old style mansard roof like that, and they're putting on a false facade to square off the building. This is a sprinklered McDonald's, thank goodness. But when they built that building, or when they built the renovation, they started the renovation, they didn't think about what they were going to do with that concealed space. So they built a concealed space and they stopped the project in its tracks. Fire Inspection Bureau gave them a cease and desist order and said until you address that, something's gotta be done. 
The building is sprinklered. That concealed space you're building in has to be sprinklered as well. Stop them in their tracks. You think that was popular? Oh, oh no. Oh, no, 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 no. Put my buddy Forrest in the hot seat. He's within his first year on the job, of course, the, you know, the call goes out to the mayor and to the economic development people and, hey, you're stopping progress. But the fact is they ended up coming up with an agreement. They didn't extend the sprinkler system into it. They actually put fire stopping in there. That was the agreement that they were, I don't want to say forced to do, but it at least was something in the right direction. Otherwise, they would have had an open area in that soffit area, in that mansard area. Right. NFPA doesn't offer uh, alert bulletins too often, but here's one they put out in March of 01 that talks about those concealed spaces. And ironically, they show a Wendy's restaurant on fire. Those concealed spaces can sneak, sneak up and kill us. We probably all know about this, the uh, engineered eye joists that are out there now, different types of, of uh, web uh, construction of them, uh, different types of flange construction of them, either laminated veneer lumber, which is layers, timber strand, which is you know, toothpicks put together, or a solid saw and flange. And the, keep in mind as I talk about this, it has to do with the, the simple fact that mass is our friend, and they are now removing the mass from those things. Okay? So I'm back to reading the fine print again, and I come across this, you can't read the fine print probably up on top, important fire safety information regarding fire rated building assemblies and components of fire rated assemblies. So as I'm reading through the legalese, the lawyer speak here, I come across that, that statement. In the event of an actual fire, okay, an actual fire, not a make-believe fire, you should immediately take any and all action necessary for your safety and the safety of others without regard for any fire rating of any product or assembly. What does that mean? We now have a study that says these things are safe. But what is this? This is their language. I didn't make this up. What does that little disclaimer tell us? You're responsible for your own safety. You're responsible for your own safety. And pretty much just ignore what we're telling you because immediately take any and all action necessary for your safety and the safety of others without regard for any fire rating or any product or assembly. And they go on. Fire tests are not representative of actual fire conditions. <coughs> Duh. We know that. We need to know that in the fire service. So when they're saying that, oh, these things are fire rated, these things are fire safe, don't worry about these things. Under normal conditions, yes, I'll give you that. Under fire conditions, forget about it. Forget about it. That's what they're telling us here. Under an actual fire conditions, Fire tests are not representative of actual fire conditions. Well, thank you very much for telling us all the rest of this is meaningless to us, is meaningless, right? No longer building buildings with vertical balloon construction. We have no shortage of buildings with horizontal balloon construction. This is that Burger King restaurant in my city, wide open from side to side, false uh, facade, roof on it, all lumber, the entire thing is a lumber yard that is put together by human hands. Engineered, designed, and constructed with human hands. So what we find out when we look at the fires in these places is something that we've identified as auto exposure. Back in the day when we were using dimensional lumbers and we had a two by 10 or a two by 12, it took time for that fire to spread from one joy space to the next joy space or one rafter space to the next rafter space. That's not so true anymore. Now we have Auto exposure, it burns through that 3 8 particle board web member and it exposes the next truss over, and, or the next space over, and the next space, and the next space, and the next space. And here's a picture from the Arnie Wolf fire. Lieutenant Arnie Wolf, Green Bay Fire Department, may he rest in peace. He fell into this basement, him and his partner, as fate would have it, he fell into the fire. His partner, she fell on the other side of the wall, was able to self-rescue with a fractured hip and I think a broken wrist. Remember, mass is our friend. Even though the bottom web member or the bottom cords of these trusses are distorted, they're still intact. Mass is our friend. Mass buys us time. Time equals safety. The web members are gone. They're completely gone. So keep that in mind. All right. Those poke throughs I talked about, some of them are engineered with them in there already. Others at the result of an electrician. I watched the guy do this with a hammer out of his tool belt. You can see that it's the shape of a hammerhead, and he ran the wires through there, and I came back later on with my, 
my buddy who owns it, and I said, hey, Jeff, they need to seal these things up. And he goes, what's the big deal, Joe? It's, it's drywall. No, you don't understand what this drywall is there for. It's there to keep the fire from going from one side to the other side. He got it. He, got, he went and got the job site manager and said, hey, you better make sure these things are fixed. He got it. It's that education component. All right? Real quick on roof access, and then we're going to get into a little, some tactical tidbits, okay? The fun part, the meat of this thing. I wait till the end because otherwise you'd be bailing out of here and we're running short of time. So just keep an eye on how, how you're going to, when you, when you look at these places and pre-plan them, how are you going to gain access to the roof? Normally, in this Mansard-style roof, uh, it's very difficult to put ladders up there. And you say, well, we'll just use our aerial. Well, even using the aerial, this is my buddy Rudy Horst out of McKinney Township, Illinois. That's a five-foot parapet wall that goes around that building. So even if you use your aerial ladder and get up there, as in this case here from Kentland in Maryland, you see they laddered the heck out of that building. God bless them. They put ladders up even where they don't need ladders up. But that's all right. Ladders are good. It's always good to throw ladders and stretch hose. And if you take a close look at the far side, the top side of that picture where the, where the group of firefighters are standing, yes, they have a an aerial ladder at a lower pitch further away. That's kind of the secret when you're positioning your aerials because you can see the one that's on the, the near side, how high that tip of that ladder is off the building. When we take a close up of that, you can still see that the tip of that aerial is whatever, five or six feet off the roof. Now, we can all get off of that ladder onto the roof, guaranteed. Gravity works, right? So now do this at two o'clock in the morning in a driving rainstorm, in wind, in, by me, in snow, slippery conditions, and you're going to step off of that ladder with a, a saw slung over your shoulder, or whatever the case is. Um, getting off is gonna be a little problem. Getting back on it, if things go wrong, is gonna be much more difficult. That's part of your pre-planning. How are we going to gain access to that roof? Here's an idea coming out of an aerial. Madison Fire Department, our state capital, they're training on a, an out-of-business Chinese restaurant here. They have on the tip of their platform a parapet ladder attachment. Anybody have that on theirs? Where you can strap a ladder to it and step out there? Not a bad thing. Actually a good thing. You know? That's a good way. And, and to train on it and know when to use it and how to use it. You still have to climb out of the bucket and get on there, so you still have to show some you know, due diligence and safety. Here's another idea that was just uh, passed around on the, that interweb thing. Uh, use of a roof ladder hooked over the tip. Again, it's another idea, but you should do this under conditions like this so that at two in the morning in a driving rainstorm, you know what you're going to do. I'm not saying this is the safest thing to do, but it might be safer. Now that's not a very high parapet directly underneath there. It looks like it's probably a foot high. That I think we can negotiate fairly well. Probably even safer to step off the side of that the side rail of that uh, aerial than to, to do a balance act over that. But nonetheless, that's why you need to visit these places. All right? The extended overhangs get to be a problem. And as a matter of fact, if you look at these restaurants that they're upscaling, that they're changing, they're getting rid of those overhangs because of maintenance issues, because of exposure issues, because of whatever. Now, I don't get into, uh, you know, I say I'm not going to argue about tactics here or strategies. But this fire chief that's standing here in the white helmet, I mean, they're doing the right thing, keep the fire from getting to the exposure, but it'd probably be a good thing to get some water on that orange stuff and put that fire out. Because if you don't, it's gonna spread to the McDonald's, and eventually, you're gonna have a tool arm blaze that caused a million dollars in damage. And that we don't want from a simple vehicle fire in the drive-through. Drive-throughs are designed for vehicles to drive through, so hallelujah, that's what happened. There all was right. no warning before this fire at the Burger King on the far northwest side. Chopper 4 overhead as firefighters fought the flames from the outside. Too dangerous to go inside. Rebecca Ooh, Clark, dangerous. That's right, George. Who was saying the fire started here in the front of the building? They were called out because someone thought a garbage can was on fire. But when they got out here, they found something much more dangerous. A quiet afternoon on the city's far northwest side was interrupted by massive flames. I was actually cutting the customer's head, and uh, all of a sudden, somebody comes to the bar stop, they start This is in the city of Milwaukee. You're going to see a good friend of mine who is a battalion chief here. We've had some conversations prior to this fire and after. What the workers did not know? When they saw the smoke, fire crews say there was actually flames racing up the walls above their heads. What happened was, because the fire went up the outside, 
we went into the overhang and was into the uh, crawl space above the sprinklers. So the sprinklers were unable to act anymore. So the fire was above them. That also means no smoke alarm sounded. Fire crews could not go into the building to try to stop it from spreading. The battalion chief said the type of roof makes it very likely to collapse. Several years ago, some firefighters were killed in a fire in a similar building in McDonald's when the roof collapsed. So we're very deliberate in not putting firefighters on the inside of the building. The roof did eventually collapse. No one was inside. Crews say the building is a total loss. I'm in disbelief, but I kind of feel bad, you know, because it's like people are out of the job now. Now, crews still don't know what started the fire. They believe it was inside that front wall, but they are still investigating. We're going to talk a little bit now about strategies and tactics. And I don't like to argue these things because it's like sex, politics, and religions. Everybody's got an idea. Everybody does it the right way, but we all disagree on the right way. So we're going to talk a little bit. Let's, let's think about some of the things we should be thinking about. First off, uh, with these grease duct fires we talked about, two major questions. Is the fire contained to the interior of the duct or has it communicated to the surrounding combustibles? I had a fire in a uh, bowling alley with a restaurant and a bar attached to it that the fire got up into the ductwork. The kitchen help didn't even know what was going on. We got a 911 call at 5 o'clock at night, fire coming through the roof. We showed up in the parking lot and a lady flagged me down and pointed to the orange stuff and said, there's a fire in that building right there. And I'm glad she pointed that out. I said, yeah, I kind of recognize that from school. So we went in there. I went around to the side entrance because I was familiar with the place through pre-planning. I knocked on the door, got into the kitchen, said, hey, you got a fire burn up here. And they looked around and said, no, we don't. I go, no, trust me. It was orange stuff. I recognize it. It's fire. You're going to have to evacuate this place. There is, there, there's two times that I had to evacuate buildings that were the most problematic in my 38, nine years in the fire service. Number one was Easter Sunday math, mass in a Catholic church due to a gas leak. I'll tell you what, I think I was stricken to hell that day. The priest was not happy that I had to say, no, you have a two-inch main leaking right in your back area there. we got to get out. And the other was a tradition up by us in Wisconsin, our Friday night fish fries. Anybody ever been to Wisconsin to have a Friday night fish fry? They live for them up there, those in old-fashioned drinks. So Friday night, fish fry night, I have to evacuate a restaurant attached to a bowling alley. It was like pulling teeth. Forget it. It was terrible. But that fire was totally inside the ductwork until it exited the roof, and you'll see a picture of that. So structurally, it didn't involve anything of the structure itself, right? And then, does the ductwork exit the restaurant directly, or is it carried to the roof via an interior system of ducts? The new code says it's got to be the, the ductwork and the uplast ventilator has to be located directly above the appliance it services. In my case, the ductwork went up, it went 25 feet over, it took a left-hand turn, went 15 feet over, and then went through the roof. It's a huge bowling alley complex. So we had to chase that through the ceiling with the, without the use of thermal imagers. This was way back in the day, before thermal imagers. So we did a lot of overhaul work just trying to locate and chase that fire. All right. The, the, um, the, Problem up on the rooftop is the, the extension of fires. If you look at that thing that's circled in the, in the circle there, that's a plastic <laughs> container that they use to collect the grease. If they don't have a good way of cleaning, it's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be a non-combustible collection container, but nonetheless, uh, you'll see what happens. You can have additional uh, grease buildup on the roof that adds additional combustibles as well. This is the rooftop on the fire that I had. At the time when we pulled up, there was a screaming noise going on from the roof, and I couldn't tell what it was at first. It turns out that it was the aluminum ventilation fan. You'll see that. We had some minor extension to the roof, and what you see, that white powder you see there, is we, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, but sometimes you're both lucky and good. And in this case, I didn't want to, I stretched the line up there for overhaul, but I chose to use an old chimney fire technique by blasting dry chem up into the ductwork and getting it sucked through the system. Worked like a million bucks. My lieutenant is standing up at the roof on the truck company at the time, and within 15 seconds he says, fire's out. I give a sigh of relief, I give a radio report, I'm happy and we go home. That's the fan that was screaming like a banshee up on the roof. About 1,220 degrees aluminum melts at, depending on the alloy, and that fan blade was melted, causing it to be off center and creating that, that noise up on the rooftop, all right? Now we won't get into the code obviously because we're pressed for time, but quite frankly, the, the uh, code just points out that that 
upblast ventilator has to be separated from the exhaust of the HVAC. And that's so you don't get recir uh, recirculation. The other thing is if the HVAC itself is, in, is uh, impacted, the failure of those lines uh, and the, the, the uh, presence of the refrigerant gases, once they're subjected to high heat or direct flame impingement, you have the production of hydrofluoric and hydrochloric acids and chlorine and phosgene gases. So if you breathe that stuff in, you're gonna kill yourself. This, this fatality report here is a fire chief in New Jersey that succumbed to that. So do yourself a favor and look that up. He was in the backside of a restaurant. They used positive pressure ventilation. He was outside in what he thought was a clean area and got a face full of smoke. 10 days later, he died as a result of congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema. They looked at his lungs and his lungs had been burned up and they figure literally by the acid that was produced there. All right. Uh, another thing you want to look at, go, Google the um, carbon dioxide event in Phoenix. They have a good video, a training video on that. Most of these places, almost all of these places, are going to have carbon dioxide systems in there. That system is used to propel the, the um, syrups and so on in their soda fountains, for their soda fountains. So if you have a failure in that, remember it's an asphyxiant, it displaces oxygen, and it can kill you. It has killed people, it has killed workers in the past. Right? Keep in mind, it's not uncommon to get delayed alarms. They try to handle things on their own, or they don't know what to do. We might have a teenage manager or assistant manager that's working there. They also want to try to avoid bad press and lengthy shutdown time. So when we show up, if it's not 4.30 in the morning on Valentine's Day in Houston, it could be very well that the fire has progressed because they didn't want to call us or don't want to call us. All right, expect the unexpected. That's every day in our business. That's what we do, right? You can expect four different types of fires, kitchen fires, exhaust hood or ductwork fires, attic or concealed space fires, and then the grease residue burning on the roof. We've had a couple of those that uh, ignited because the fan overheated, the fan was dirty and so on. Make sure you check for those fires in concealed, concealed spaces, right? And the kitchens are normally through the rear door. You might save yourself some time going through there, but remember what I said earlier in the case in Kenosha. Don't always use the entrance of convenience or opportunity. Make sure you do the 360 plus, right? <laughs> Make sure that you're entering, that you're sending your crew's interior under your terms and conditions through a safe means of entrance, all right? Of egress, of ingress, rather. Expect early collapse, like you heard in a couple of these videos tonight. Once it gets up in that concealed space, starts burning off that gravity resistant system, back your crews out. That, just, that obviously means that there's a significant amount of fire, that that building's gonna end up in a dumpster and hauled away within a week or two, and six months later you'll be there for the balloon giveaway and the ribbon cutting. All right? That's the fact of the matter. I'm not pr pr uh, professing here that you can't fight fires in these buildings, but you have to do it under your terms and conditions. All right. There are large electrical and large gas supply lines in these places. They use a lot of energy. So make sure that the gas supply is shut down. Go to the meter and shut it down. Normally they're tied into the, the um, uh, extinguishing, the hood system, but if the hood system hasn't activated, there's still big gas pipes running through that building. All right? There's still a lot of electricity that you have to deal with. Make sure, you know, we talked about oil and water not mixing and creating uh, problems for us in the fire attack. Be very cautious with applying water to the, the superheated oil that's on fire. We can do it. I mean, we use a wet chemical system to put the fires out, but just be very careful on how you do that. And make sure you look at that entire run of ductwork. Make sure one way or another you get up in there and either through your overhaul process or through the use of the thermal imager or whatever, you take a good look at that. Get, that, get a line to the roof. Normally we don't let hose lines up on our roof, but we get them up there to prevent extension up on the roof, and we tell them, be very cautious with your water application. We don't want to fill up that ductwork. We fill up the ductwork, you could cause early collapse, you cause more problems. We do not want that. Right? Uh, Flare-ups with the cooking oil, that just goes, to, if you don't extinguish it, you don't smother it, you don't remove the oxygen, you don't put that fire out with some you know, chemical chain reaction inhibiting product, so you may expect flare-ups from that. We talked about access to the roof as well. Expect difficulty. Pre-planning is the key. When you get home from this conference, go to the drive through order your coffee, look above your head, see what they have to offer in that building. Predict where, how you would get to the roof. All right? And you're gonna see a quick lessons learned here. 
We got a couple minutes. Where's my, where's the boss? Where's the president? Just a couple minutes. I know I'm running over, but that's me. Um, don't commit apparatus or attack lines until it's been determined exactly where the fire is located. All right, you're going to see that. Shut down the, the exhaust hood system. Um, fix suppression system. If it's going to help you, pull the hook. Pull the, the manual release if that's going to help you. Oftentimes the, uh, the um, uh, releases are you know, blocked with grease or buildup or whatever. Uh, just make sure that you have control under that. Again, under your terms and conditions. Right? Again, you have to check the entire ductwork. Look at the high heat buildup. That's in that fire that I had. And the, the, uh, the, duct, the fire communicated through that ductwork and to some ceiling tile members and so on. If you're going to use dry chem in these places, if they choose to use dry chem, just be aware of the cleanup process. It's not good customer service to do that. We've had some uh, well-meaning police officers run in there and save the day by discharging a five pound dry chemical extinguisher and cause thousands of dollars of cleanup damage when we would have went in probably with a CO2 extinguisher, put out the vat and be done with it. All right, so just be careful about that. The high heat buildup, that was the ceiling tile adjacent uh, touching the ductwork that we had. Very hot, obviously, to char the fiberglass like that. And keep in mind that you can't salvage ruined stock. Once it's ruined, it's ruined. It is not worth the life of one of your firefighters to go in there and try to save Happy Meals. Let's face it, it's going to all go to the dumpster when they haul that place or haul that building away. So you can't, don't, don't expect to save any of that stuff. We talked about void spaces creating that safer work environment, no property worth the life of a firefighter. Especially in the chief position that I have now, the last thing I want is to have to make that walk up the sidewalk and knock on a door and break the news to a loved one that your mother, father, sister, brother, loved one has perished in the line of duty in a fire. And when they say, well, were they trying to rescue a baby? Were they trying to save grandma from her bedroom? And I say, no, they were trying to save Happy Meals. I don't ever want to be in that, I don't ever, ever want to be in that position, but if, they're, if I'm going to be put in that position, I want it to be for a valiant reason and not trying to save Happy Meals. So there's no property worth the life of a firefighter. Now real quick here as we wrap up, I want to take a look, a real quick look at a lessons learned thing. And here we are, Newburgh, Oregon. Their engine shows up for a report of a fire in this McDonald's restaurant. Now would you agree by looking at the smoke on the right hand side of the slide that there is two somethings going on here? And two somethings I mean by two different colors of smoke. And I usually in a room like this I have to explain what you see in the background right here is not a tree. That's smoke back behind the other smoke. All right? Would you agree that there's two somethings going on here? There's that lazy brownish, light brown smoke that's coming out the front and there's something happening in the back where the Newburgh engine shows up on the scene and they drive past here. Here's Andy standing out front with Caden and his friends, and hopefully they're all there, because if not, they're, one of them, little Billy, might be inside this play place here. All right? Keep an eye on that play place as we go through these three slides. And the Newburgh engine drives past, and the people from McDonald's are standing there saying, hey, where the hell are you going? Look at the smoke in that play place. It's starting to get a little darker, a little thicker. Maybe little Billy was in that uh, tube right underneath the, the golden arches there. And Newburgh does a U-turn at the end of the parking lot and comes back in there, and now you can see that there's something else, I mean, there's two somethings going on here. We have two separate and distinct smoke conditions, all right? Look at that play place now. They, put the, they lock the air brakes, they stretch a line to the most convenient door, and they're going to make a fire attack, an interior fire attack on there. And this is the slide I say, if you're going to commit personnel to the inside, and you do that 360, you have to do the 360 to start with, and you have to do the 360 plus. You have to look above your head and below you. If you know there's no basement here, and you take a look on this side, that's what's going on on the opposite side. Significant difference than that front side where the engine's at. Somebody has to take a look at that. The roof is burning off this place, obviously. The gravity resistance system is being threatened. If you look closely, let me go back to that. If you look closely, you can see the smoke starting to infiltrate out of that. That whole concealed space is full of, is full of superheated gases and the product of combustion, and it's ready to let loose. So if you're going to commit personnel, your terms and conditions, okay, your terms and conditions. Remember, it's easier to justify to a property owner why you went defensive than to explain to a grieving family why you didn't. Think about that a minute. 
I would much rather go to the owner who probably wants to place bulldozed under those conditions anyways than to go to a family and say, I'm terribly sorry, but I have to inform you of the loss of whatever. I don't ever want to be put into that position. So keep that in mind. And, and I'm very certain that nobody in this room does. So last slide here. Who are these folks here in Tucson? What are, what are they doing? Are they going to put that fire out? No. Who are they doing this for? For the public, for the owner, for the media. I mean, they're so far away out of the collapse zone that the arches could collapse and not hit them. And that's okay. Because as I say up above, evacuate the structure and go defensive against the structure, against the building, right? But go offensive for firefighter safety. That's what it's all about. We return home from this, right? We return home. A building with that much fire in it is going to be bulldozed and hauled off in dumpsters and rebuilt, and once again, you're gonna be there for the grand opening of the new place. So, we go right back to this. Those who do not remember the past are destined to repeat it. We talked about Houston, we talked about Boston, we talked about a lot of things today. I ask that you take one thing away from this today, and that is that we have learned from the successes and unfortunate failures of those that have come before us. With that, I will say thank you very much. Chief Nitter, thank you very much for the information you gave today. I think this is something that we can all take home and use. We all have this hazard in our, in our hometowns and, and in our areas, so we certainly appreciate it. A small token of our appreciation thank for you your very presentation. Much. Appreciate